Hello friends and happy new year and welcome back to the Bikes for Death podcast. As always, my name is Patrick and I'm your host and we are starting off the new year with a bang with a great conversation with my friend Sofian Sahili. Sofian made a Instagram post at the end of last year that really caught my attention and after reading the post i immediately messaged him and asked him if this was a topic that he would be interested in diving into further to which he immediately agreed and i think for context of today's conversation instead of sending you to his instagram to read his post right now so this can be a self-contained episode and hopefully make it a little bit easier on you. I'm gonna take just a moment to read his post that he made. The graphic associated with this post was a list of all of his wins from 2019 through 2023. And the caption reads as follows. So where do I go from here? Last year, I realized what started as a dream before transforming into an ambition by winning the Tour Divide I subsequently won my second and third Silk Road mountain bike race. Last summer, I dug as deep as I could to secure the third one, a race that came as close to perfection as I think possible. I climbed to the pinnacle of off-road ultra, exceeding by far what I originally had set out to achieve. Is it great? Yeah, sure. But who wakes up in the morning thinking about their past achievements? No one. People wake up in the morning thinking about new challenges. The problem is that there's not many challenges left for me in this sport. It can't just be about racking up wins. It can't be about just doing my job. There has to be more for me to go out and push my limits. This is a time of doubt. This is a time that I knew would come when I'm done proving to me and to the world that I can be the best. Is it great to be a champion? I honestly don't know. It sure is great to become one. There's nothing better than having goals and working hard to achieve them. I've always said that the one thing that I love more than winning a race is leading one. I guess it's the same for my career. They say it's lonely at the top, and I don't mind loneliness, but I like climbing much more than I like descending. It is a time of doubt, and there's no lesson to be taken from this social media post. This is no elaborate strategy to build a certain image. It's just me being honest and telling you that I feel a bit lost at the moment. That even if I always knew that this would only be a chapter in my life, it's scary to look at the hole it's eventually going to leave. He followed up this post with another one that dives into this topic a little bit more, but I think that's good enough to get the gist of what today's conversation is going to be about. After reading that post, I realized how fortunate I am to be able to have access to somebody who is at the top of a sport, any sport. How rare is it in life to reach the pinnacle of anything? And I was really excited to delve deeper into this conversation with Sofian to get the behind the scenes, understand what's going on in his mind and get his thoughts and perspectives that only he can have as the person in his position. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I enjoyed this topic. And as always, I enjoy Sofian's honesty, his candor, his thoughtfulness, and his willingness to share his stories, his experiences, his thoughts with me and with you. So that's what we got for you today. But before we get to it, let's take a moment to thank the people that made today's episode possible, starting with our newest patrons. So first off, we'd like to give a shout out and a huge thanks to Samuel Graham and Dennis Vandegrift. And we'd also like to thank a couple patrons who increased their monthly donations. So we'd also like to thank Chris Clodfelter and Crispin Holt for joining Patreon and helping to produce these episodes. That brings our total up to 313 patrons, and we appreciate all of you so much for contributing to help produce these shows. If you would like to support this work, you can find out more over at patreon.com forward slash bikes or death. All right, and today's episode is also brought to us by my friends over at Old Man Mountain. 
Eric from Old Man Mountain, welcome back to the Bikes for Death podcast. It's a new year and we've got some new and exciting things to talk about. So thanks for coming back on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Um, great to talk to you. As you said, we've got Axle Pack this year coming out in just a week. Axle Pack, a new product. Shocking. Y'all are rolling out products faster than we can uh, create mini pods to keep up with them. But uh, I expect that we'll do be doing many more to to highlight all the products as they come out. But this is an exciting one that comes with an exciting offer exclusive for Bikes for Death listeners. And that's not marketing speech. That's real. This is an exclusive offer for Bikes for Death listeners. So first yeah. off, Eric, tell us about the Axle Pack. What is it? Yeah, so Axle Pack is honestly really simple. It's just one of those things that because we make through axles and not many people do or mount things to through axles, it hasn't come out yet. But it's just a rail that adds three pack mounts to any fork you want, but they're through axle mounted so they can't slip, they can't spin, doesn't matter what shape your fork is, suspension, carbon, steel, aluminum, you want to throw a wood fork in there? Sure, who cares? Like, <laughs> no matter what the shape is. Uh, it's going to work. So what we're really excited about is it's going to turn all kinds of bikes that would be great for bike packing, but are just missing that extra mount without having to add a full front rack. You can just add this simple three pack mount, super lightweight. It weighs just 73 grams per side because it's axle mounted. You don't have to worry about ripping eyelets out of your fork, whether it's because you're getting extra adventurous and overloading it, or if you accidentally hit a rock on the side of the trail, um, we see you know, lots of damaged eyelets out there on the internet. And with this, it doesn't matter. Your fork's totally good. Uh, this is going to totally withstand that impact because it's just an aluminum piece that's got those eyelets in it. And we actually put four in so you can choose if you want to mount it lower, mount it higher. You've got all the options. Yeah, man. I mean, it's crazy that it's taken something like this so long to come to market because we've seen um, you mentioned the eyelets getting ripped out, which is not great, but that's only if you have the eyelets. Mm -hmm. What we've seen historically is people just duct taping things to their forks or suspension forks. And I've always heard that that's not the best way to mount it. It seems intuitive that that's not the best way to mount things to your bike. But until now, there really hasn't been a great option. So I, I love this product. It's so simple. It opens up a variety of options for mounting all kinds of things to your bike, any fork, any bike. I love it. I love that you guys are always thinking outside the box and finding just simple ways to turn bikes into adventure bikes, into bikepacking bikes, into carry whatever you want and go wherever you want bikes. And um, I think that's awesome. Why is this a special deal for Bikes for Death listeners? So this officially launches on the 16th of January. But it's available right now to any Bikes or Death listeners if you go to oldmanmountain.com forward slash B-O-D. Yeah, buddy. So this episode with Sofian drops on the 10th. So you, as a Bikes or Death listener, get an advanced copy, so to speak, of this new product from Old Man Mountain. But wait, there's more. Eric, if they'd like to take 10% off their order, in addition to being the first to get this product, how do they get that 10% off? Yeah, so coupon code MOUNTAINS, plural, MOUNTAINS OR DEATH. That's right. Put it in at checkout. Watch those savings appear in your cart and uh, go ride your damn bike. Sounds great. <laughs> All right, Eric. Well, thanks again for coming on. It looks like a good product. It looks like a great product, and I can't wait to get my hands on it and try it for myself. I'm wondering, I wonder what bike I'm going to turn into a uh, do everything bike. Oh, I'm I'm going to be um you know a good an interesting use could be the AZT bike that I'm riding. I'm going to be riding a carbon full suspension bike, so that really probably would be an excellent. Uh, use because as you know full suspension um, I'm going to be taking on the Arizona Trail as an ITT mm -hmm. and you got to carry a lot of stuff there's not a lot of resupplies got to carry a lot of water the mm -hmm. weather temperatures range greatly and so I'm going to be desperately looking for ways to put more gear on that bike um, and so I think that's going to be a perfect way to test out this product for me personally yeah that's a good one because you really got to keep it light on that too with the hike and bike sections yeah 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 yeah, it's a mixture of trying to keep it light and then not freeze to death at night. So, you know, or run out of water. So it's that's kind of one of the challenges of that trail. 
Well, good deal, man. Uh, it's exciting. Appreciate you coming on to tell us about it. And uh, thanks for the exclusive offer for Bikes or Death listeners, man. That's cool. Let's get some people out there riding their damn bike. Have a good day, Eric. Talk to you later, Patrick. All right, All right bye-bye. That's it. The bills have been paid. And now it is time to get into my chat with Sophie on. But first, let's have my friend Miles Arbor kick it off with the Bikes or Death theme song. You load up your bike, you ride away from home. You could be with your friends or you could be alone. You ride for a day or maybe more. You just love being in the great outdoors. Everything you need is strapped to your bars, including that new pillow you got from Santa Claus. And then you think, oh shit to yourself. You left that super lightweight tent on the living room shelf. Bikes. I'm just happy that you have a phone. Silk Road reference. Yeah, I have two actually now. Though the because I the one that I broke, I uh, I had it fixed in uh, in Kyrgyzstan. Um and then I uh, and then I bought a new one. And oh. I have all my all my games that are on the old one, so I keep the old one just in my games. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to lose my progress. That's the most important question I'm going to ask you today. What what games are so important? Uh, that you fixed your old phone and haven't got rid of it. What games are you playing? Um, uh, it's really still a games actually, but they, I don't know. They calm me down there. They're, they're, uh, um, the, one is called the water sword puzzle. These are like really old games. And the other one is called nonogram, but they, they're just like these really kind of s- stupid, but satisfying games where you just kind of sort of need to, to solve the puzzle and when it's solved even if it's really easy it's like it brings you that that satisfaction so i like to play it for i don't know 20 or 30 minutes before before i um not before i sleep because before i sleep i read a book but before i start reading my book i like to play my games what book are you reading right now i am reading a book by a very famous french novelist um that is called michel welbeck and uh, it's called uh, Les Particules Elementaires, so probably something along the lines of elementary particles, something like that. And it's 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 from the '90s. Is one of the most frame, famous uh, authors alive that is alive in France. Um, and I don't know. It's 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 interesting because I I mean I started reading it. Because you wrote an essay about uh, Lovecraft, and I'm a big fan of, of science fiction in general, and, and, and Lovecraft in particular. So I started reading that book, and it's it's like it's it's kind of a book that I read off quite often because I I I don't know I like it, but I have never read his How the Work, which is like much more famous actually. Um, so this is just an obscure essay that he wrote about Lovecraft. He's a, he's a big fan of Lovecraft, of Lovecraft as well, but he's like very, very famous for all, all these novels and I had never, ever read his novels. And then I was like, yeah, why not? And, um, it's not that they're really good, but I'm just kind of wondering why he's so successful <laughs> because he's, if he seems so depressed and he has, a take on life that is so dark, you know, but not dark in a way that um, is going to kind of make you feel um, like you're getting out of your daily life. It's, it's, it's dark and depressed, but very much as, as, um, as like your daily life would be if you would be depressed, you know. So it's very strange for me that he's like so successful because I do... <laughs> I do get uh, how uh, funny it can be to be that depressed, but I don't think that a lot of people actually get that. So hmm. well, I don't know; it's a big mystery. Yeah, yeah. It sounds it sounds interesting. Um, maybe you have, yeah. Maybe you have a greater understanding and relationship with kind of pain and suffering and and hard times than than your average uh, human. <laughs> Um, so it might speak to you but, in a different on, way. On the other hand, I am, I'm quite a happy person. <laughs> yeah. And I've, and I've quite a, quite a, uh, an optimistic take on life, you know? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, 
I'm not, I mean, I've, I've, I'm not the kind of people that, the kind of person that, that feels depressed often, you know, most of the time I'm just, I'm just, I'm just happy. I'm just happy to do, you know, what I love and being with pers- people that I like or, or, or love. But I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of funny to, to read that guy and he, he is like basically his take on life is that it's just a horrible jungle where people have, are just like ill-intended and everyone like dies alone and you know all that sort of, sort of stuff <laughs> but it's, sometimes it's, it's it's really quite funny because the little things seems to make him sort of happy like he he, he loves supermarkets is like uh one of one of the, one of his books that I was reading uh, earlier uh towards the end of the book the, the hero is, is is an old guy he moves to the countryside to be alone pretty much like myself and he actually discovers that the, the supermarket is most empty on on tuesday morning so he that's the 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 time of the week that he picks to get to get his groceries and um he's like yeah it's it's some sort of uh of uh, that's as close as it can be to heaven to be alone in the supermarket. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of quite funny to, to have that very dark take on life and then not trying to find some sort of salvation in the spiritual things, but kind of feeling it in the stupidest, most material stuff like a supermarket and groceries. Right, That's right. Kind of fun. Finding finding your sanctuary at a grocery store at Tuesday morning when no one else is there, like that's what's bringing you instead joy. Of, instead of I don't know a church or a support group or whatever, <laughs> yeah, synagogue. Like, <laughs> yeah. The way the way to cure your depression is just to yeah go to Walmart. <laughs> You know, and maybe maybe a little bit of a secret in life. I I too consider I am an optimist. I I can't help it. I'm endlessly optimistic. I I also know what depression depression and sadness feel like, but those aren't feelings that that I deal with like a lot. You know, but maybe there's a little bit of uh, you know, the secret of life is finding your happiness at Tuesday market Tuesday morning at a supermarket that's empty, you know, like yeah. in a world that maybe is chaotic and I don't know. I mean, everybody has their own lives and struggles and stuff. And so there's a, that's a big topic, but you know, finding, finding some happiness in the small things in life uh, and maybe not needing, maybe not needing to be the best bike pack racer in the world to uh, feel satiated and feel satisfied by your accomplishments. But um, yeah. yeah, finding, finding joy in the little things. I don't know. I need to read the book though. Uh, do you know if it's translated in English? Uh, most likely. Yes. He's uh, right. again. He's a very famous author. So yeah, yeah. Uh, most likely, uh, all of his works are uh, translated in, in several languages because it's like again pretty famous. Yeah, yeah. I'm a. Uh, I'm not much of a uh, gamer. I don't. I. Uh, I don't play like any phone games or video games or anything like that. But I am a big uh, reader. I love to read, and um, oftentimes I I ingest reading on audiobooks um, when I'm riding or just in the car on trips and stuff like that. So I'm interested. I'll check it out. I'll send you a few a few oh, of, the, oh, of yeah. these books that I read, and I and I'll I'll tell you which one talks about what. I would love that. I would appreciate. It. I'll uh, I'll actually include it in the in the show notes, uh, so other people yeah. can uh, uh, get your reading recommendations as well. I think I think that'd be cool. Um, right. You know, once you once you're done listening to all the Bikes for Death podcasts two or three times, and you have, yeah. um, you know, you're on a long bike ride and you need something else to listen to, we can offer some recommendations for people. <laughs> yeah, Sofian. Welcome back to the podcast, man. It's great to see you again. Last time I saw yeah, you, I was for having me dropping you off in El Paso, Texas, uh, after winning Tour Divide in 2022, man. So it's been a while, but it's great to see you again. I really appreciate yeah, you coming it's, on. It's been a while. Yeah, thanks for uh, for uh, inviting me, especially to talk about uh, what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Well, listen, man, you've been on the podcast at least three times, maybe four times. I didn't go back and count, but you've been on a few times and uh, you're very well known. So let's just let's just get right into it. Um, yeah. You made a 
you made a post on uh, social media that really stood out to me uh, just like a couple of days ago. And uh, the, the image was a graphic and the graphic was uh, some of your wins. So I'm going to just list those for the audience. We have the Italy divide in 2019, the Inca divide in 2019, Atlas mountain race in 2020, French divide in 2020, and then you won the Silk Road three times in a row, back to back in 2021, 22, 23. And as I just mentioned, you won the Tour Divide in 2022. Did I miss any? <laughs> uh, yeah, you missed the Bright Midnight that I won uh, this year in Norway. Ah, uh, that was this year, 2023 Bright Midnight yeah, in Norway. Yeah. 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 So the first line of your caption uh, assigned to that graphic was, so where do I go from here? And almost immediately, I was like, oh, I want to talk to Sofian about this. I want to know what's going <laughs> on. Um, so, yeah, like, let's just get into it. What, what's going on behind the scenes? What prompted you to make that post? Um, it's, it's just that um, I, was, I was contemplating going to New Zealand in January to take part in uh, uh, a race that is called Tour to Waipunamu that is uh, organized by uh, Brian Alder, uh, which is a friend of mine that I met on the 2016 Tour Divide. And um, I'm usually quite excited when I make uh, plans for trips and races and, uh, and especially fleeing the, the winter in, uh, in France to get to somewhere on the other side of the planet. And I was contemplating doing that, and I just, I don't know, I couldn't, you know, get to, to get myself to buy the tickets. And I couldn't really get myself to commit to that. And I, was real, I wasn't really excited. Um, and I felt it was weird because, because New Zealand is a beautiful place, because I have, I have friends there, because um, the race is going to be very interesting with some uh, very, very good racers. Uh, Louis Sedor, who won the Tour de Vide in uh, 20, is it 17 or 18? I can't remember. I think it's 18. Um, I want to say 18, and, uh, too. Yeah. yeah, I want to say 18. Um, and uh, Joe Nation, who, uh, who, who took part in Tour de Vide this year and is a, a super strong rider as well with a good cross-country background. Uh, Steve Halligan and uh, Martin Strucker. Well, a, a really nice uh some good competition at the start of this race and um yeah i was i wasn't really excited about about it i wasn't excited about that and i was and i, I started wondering why i started wonder, wondering why i couldn't really get myself to book these tickets and why i wasn't excited about going away and and going on a long trip and traveling and, and riding my bike and um and then i was like maybe i I'm just maybe I'm just tired, a little bit tired at the end of uh, of the season, and maybe it's that thing that I thought would happen. Uh, well, pretty much when you drop me in El Paso, <laughs> so to to put the things back in their context, I uh, I started uh, my racing career in 2016 on Tour Divide, and. It's, it didn't start as a bike pack racing career. It started as just the, the goal, the objective of, of winning Tour Divide. And I chased that goal for eight years. And while I was chasing that goal, I was also building a bike packing career and winning a bunch of races all over the world. And, but, well, but I never really uh, stopped thinking about 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 Tour Divide and why I was I was there in the first place and and ever since I had started uh, racing I had always uh, uh, told myself that after Tour Divide I would just uh, not necessarily retire but I would I would have to re reevaluate everything with that cuz that was always the end goal uh, but instead of doing that I I just I just Went home, recovered a little bit, went straight uh, back to Kyrgyzstan, raced, won, um, went home again, uh, went on a trip with my girlfriend, 
uh, and then raced um, in South Africa and Namibia, the uh, Rhino Run, and then went home and then went on another trip uh, with my girlfriend and then boom, it was the start of the 2023 season. So I didn't really have time to actually stop and think about what winning Tour Divide uh, really meant in terms of, well, now it's done. What's, what's, there, what's left to be done, you know? And then the season started and I, and I, um, I had the, the, the goal of winning a cell cord for a third time, which seemed crazy. Um, uh, especially with the uh, the lineup at the at the start of the race this year it was like pretty much all of the best bikepackers in the world. But I still managed to win, and then after that, I think that's when it where it happens was well, like it was kind of my masterpiece that race because, um, well, it's the Silk Road, so it's it's legendary, it's really hard. It's uh, also, as I mentioned, um, maybe one, if not the um, just most stacked lineup of any bikepacking race. And I, and I came, on, came out on top. And then I was like, how am I, how, how I going to ever top that uh, of being able to to perform on such a stage against uh, uh, such athletes, um, riding blazing fast pace through Kyrgyzstan, which is always amazing, but also hostile. And it's kind of like, yeah, you do that, and then you're like, can I be much better than that? Probably not. Can I win a fourth time? Possibly, but what would be the point? Am I gonna go back to Tour Divide? Unlikely, because I've been there. I've been there a bunch, and it's it's not getting easier. It's like Tour Divide wears you wears you down every, every time you go. It, for me, at least, it gets harder and harder. And so, um, yeah, there I was. Actually, there I am, having won pretty much all of the biggest races on the on the off-road bikepacking circuit um having ticked my own personal boxes pretty much all of them and and kind of wondering well yeah where do i go from here uh i still have a few boxes that i want to tick though but after that what's what's going to happen you know yeah yeah that's that's a perfect uh entryway into this conversation and um It's why I love podcasting. Um, You put on your uh, Instagram at the end of your your caption, it said, well, here's two Instagram captions that are too long um, because (laughs) there's obviously a lot more that you wanted to say, but Instagram is a limited format and uh, that's where podcasting comes in. So um, I'm, I'm excited to dive more into this topic and I thought it was, there's not many people in the world who are in a position that you're in, in any discipline, whether it's in business or sport or whatever, when you're at the top and you start looking around, that's a that's something that not everybody can relate to. And I'm interested to talk about it. As we build the context of, of this conversation, I was thinking, could we go back to potentially like 2018, Sophie on, like you started in 2016. So by 2018, you'd gotten your feet wet. And then, you know, after 2018, it was like just winning, you know, from, from then yeah. on, it was just a lot of wins. So what were, what were 2018 Sophie on's goals what did you want to accomplish? What were those boxes that you were trying to tick? Um, or what were they? Did you think that they were at that time in your life? Actually, you know what? I would, I would even go back to 2016 and sure. my, I, right after my first tour of Ide. So first tour of Ide, I finished third, uh, the great late and great Mike Hall, uh, won the race in, uh, just under 14 days and I finished in, in 16 days. So needless to say, I was far, far from, from, from his level. 
but I was learning. It was it was my first ever bike packing race. I, I made a ton of mistakes. I know there was like a ton of room for improvement. And I started dreaming. I just I just started dreaming of of being the best and winning all the big races. And at, and we're talking 2016. And at that time, 2016, the big races was pretty much Tour Divide, Trans Am, and TCR and all transcontinental uh, race in Europe. So the other races were not around. They just did not exist at that time. And um, and that was that was pretty much yeah the the the. But it was again it was it was kind of a dream you know it was not a plan it was I feel that I had what what it takes to climb to the top but it's not that I knew it you know it's not I mean I mean I thought it was a possibility um, and then. Yeah, the the Tour de Vat still uh, was the the main the main goal, and then as the the landscape of bike packing started getting bigger, and there were more and more races, um, then my ambition started, you know, being different. And then I think I kind of got caught up in that whole being a bike pack racer and having a career. And for the three years that COVID uh, robbed us of Tour Divide, I had to invest myself in, 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 in stuff that were different and just like different challenges, different, different races. But, but pretty much, yeah, that, that what started before 2016 was started actually in 2014 when I, when I first was on the Great Divide mountain bike route and I heard about Tour Divide. What started as... I want to race this and win it, then just transform it into I want to win this race and I want to climb to the top and be the best and win all the big races. And now you have. And now I have. And now I have. And it's, it's, it's great. It's great. But it's just that what's left to be done when you've done all this and it's a really good question and it's, and it's something that I feel we, I don't really, I, I, I'm very interested in sports. I follow sports. I watch lots of sports and I'm interested in athletes. And I don't think I've ever heard an athlete talk about, you know, what comes after um, winning, I don't know how many grand slams if you're, if you're a tennis player or winning the World Cup and the Champions League, if you're uh, a football player or or what happened to jordan after he won six rings you know yeah I'm, like, i don't i don't, follow don't uh, talk about that yeah i follow uh tennis i i'm a big tennis player not i i know who michael jordan is but i'm not familiar with that sport uh too much but like yeah what keeps djokovic motivated how many times has he won the Wimbledon? Like twenty times. I don't. I can't keep track. I, I don't follow it that closely. But he's uh, he just can't stop winning. But he never he never like lets his foot off the gas. He's finding something. Um, all these athletes are Jordan. I mean, whoever um, stays at the top for a really long time, they're finding a way to continually uh, light a fire to stay motivated, to stay training, to stay mentally focused. And, and you're right. You don't ever hear about any of them talking about the struggles with that. And you have to assume that they're having struggles, right? Uh, of course. It, it, can't, it can't be easy to always, it, there's no way it's easy to be at top, but they're always finding that internal motivation. And on some level, like when I read your post, it sounds like that's the part that you're grappling with is, is trying to find what lights your fire right now? What gets you excited? And and I'll I'll quote you. In uh, you made a film about uh, your third Silk Road mountain bike race uh, titled "The Will to Win," and one of the things that you said in there is to be a successful bike pack racer, you have to want it really bad, like really, really, really bad. And you said I do. And um, so maybe you could like 
maybe you could talk about like what where your motivation comes from and i'm curious if that's part of what you're struggling with is like wondering where your motivation comes with comes from now where does that will to win come from now um i think it's 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 just it's probably two things. It's probably first, first off, it starts with, you know, setting a goal, having a dream, uh, having a dream, but not just a dream. The thing about dreams is that you kind of wish that they're going to happen, which you, that's, that's the way that I, 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 I see the word dream. You know, it's something that you kind of hope it's going to happen, but it's not something that you work towards to. I, I, I think we need to, talk more about an ambition a goal so maybe it could start with a dream you're under your shower or you're going you're trying to fall asleep and you're kind of yeah daydreaming about what what i wish my perfect life would be and in my perfect life i would just be the best at what i love so it can start like that and then to to make this dream come true, you have to work towards it. So you, so you have to set some some actual goals and you have to train and work hard towards these goals. So it can, can start with, with okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on Tour Divine. I'm going to win Tour Divine. And then once once I, I won Tour Divine, then it was about winning a uh, uh, so-called mountain race again. Um, but it was something that I had actually planned before winning Tour Divide. So I was just uh, on that, on that ride, you know, on that train, then like you, you, you hop on that, on, on that winning train or on that, on that building a career train, then you just like, you need for the train to stop before you, you, you get off. So I, I was still on that, on that, on that journey. And, and it was just about building that, that legacy, you know, feeling like, when you think about it, when you think about winning the Silk Road Mountain Race three times in a row, it's madness. It's just like, because first of all, finish it. Just finish it three times. Mm. And you'll see, like, so much can happen there. So much can happen. Like, it's really, it's really rough riding. So any, you know, you know mechanicals, crash, that can happen. Um, I mean, it's also a, a developing country with the very poor hygiene. So a lot of people uh, get ill, have diarrhea. Even if they, if they can keep going, they're depleted. Um, it's also, you, you, it gets really cold at night, during, really hot during the day. So people just uh, have um, chest infections or whatever. There's like so many people that, that end up even if they finish, they end up in it being very, very, very slow and 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 and, and depleted, and just um, and you have to somehow manage to avoid all these hurdles just to just to finish and then to win it, and especially winning this year um, when you had so many people that had prior experience of winning of that so many bike pack racers that knew what it takes to actually win a race. Um, and, and just doing it three times, it's, it's so hard to top that. It's so hard to like be okay. Yeah. When it's four times. All right. But at some point it's just like, I don't, there's no meaning at some point, you know, when you're just like, when it's, it's like, uh, so you, you follow tennis. So it's like Rafael Nadal. Who knows how many Roland Garros he has won. Is it eight? Is it nine? Is it 10? No one has any idea because it's too much, you know? <laughs> and you don't want to be the Rafael Nadal of, of, of bike packing, you know? You want people to, to have some interest in, in watching the, the Silk Road Mountain Race at some point, you know? So yeah. it's, it's just that I wanted to prove, I guess, to go back to, the, to your actual question, I wanted to prove that, that I was just the best, you know? that I, w- I could be, I could have the consistency of winning, 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 and reigning every time I had set myself that goal of winning. Not, it's, I don't think it's actually possible to win all of the races because like, as, as I say in that film, you, you need to want it 
really, really bad. And it's just like to mentally uh, uh, strain yourself and inflict yourself the kind of damage that you need to inflict yourself to win a bikepacking race three times, four times, five times a year, that would that would be just pure madness. I don't – because you, you need to dig so deep, so deep to do that. So you can do it once, twice, maybe three times a year, but doing it like race after race after race, like every two two months or something like that, um, maybe it's doable. It's not doable for me, definitely not. So I need a few races here and there where I'm just going to uh, 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 step my foot up the gas and just enjoy the ride and just be like, all right, I'm just going to finish on the top 10, top five, whatever. But I'm not going to you know, go for several nights in a row and not sleeping and... and but still, yeah, winning that many races off road, where I feel that that is that it has the more prestige because it's where it's the hardest, and it, that's also where the the there's more uncertainty. You know, when when you're on the road, there's many more uh, there's less variables that that are out of your controls. But when you're off road, then there's also the mechanicals that can happen, and then. These mechanicals, when you're on the road, while well, you're on the road, there's just, there's people, you know. You hop on a car, you get to the you get to the bike shop, and uh, and then you fix your mechanical, and then you get to go. Uh, but what happens when you're in the middle of nowhere and you get a mechanical? There's no there's no one to to help you there. So I wanted to prove that I could be the best, but now I think I I think I. I think people know now. <laughs> I think the secret. I think people out. are like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he he, he can win. If he sets his mind to 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 it, and he trains for it, and he and, and and his goal is to win that race, yeah, he can do it. I think the I'm a huge Rafael Nadal fan, and so I love that reference. But yeah, essentially you've become the the Rafael Nadal of clay court tennis, right? Like uh, it, you don't ever expect Rafael Nadal to lose on clay. Um, you just don't. You don't expect Djokovic to lose on grass. Um, and one of the I got into your comments on the post. I really enjoyed it because. One thing that's great about having an online presence is if you put anything on the internet, everybody's going to tell you how you should be living your life, which is always yeah. fun. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I, I so I got into the comments. I was curious what people were saying, what what uh, life advice they were giving you, and one of your replies back. It was actually the Eddie Clark. Um, I just thought was brilliant, and you said uh, the thing about eating is it's better when you're hungry. So essentially, you're alluding to the fact that you're not as hungry right now. You've kind of ate all these big races. You've accomplished all these things. And I'm reading between the lines here, but I'm interested to get your take. It sounds like you're you're missing that fire. You're you're not as hungry right now. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not as hungry. I don't have. I don't have anything to prove. I don't. I sure, surely don't have anything to prove to myself. Um, I've proven a lot to myself. I don't have, I don't think I have much to prove to anyone else actually. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what we were saying about these, these champions that managed to stay at the top for so long. It's amazing because you, you need that hunger. You need that hunger. You, but at some point, how do you stay hungry when you've when you've been so successful? How do you keep being wanting? How do you keep yeah yearning for that success when you've had it for for several years and when you've had uh, uh, it's just I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they stay motivated. I don't know how they a rough on the dog goes for ninth. Or long hours, so like what? What make? What difference is it gonna make for him? Yeah, seven, eight, nine, ten. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just that my. I feel like maybe I always knew. I always knew that that competitive bikepacking would just be a chapter of my life. I started late. I started um, 
So in 2016, I was 34 years old. So obviously, I had a life before that. And obviously, I knew that I would have a life after. Um, so, and maybe it's different for, for these champions that, that grew up uh, uh, and started, you know, when you're when you're professional tennis player or professional uh, basketball or football player, you start, you know, practicing from from five, six years old. And it's just it's your whole life. Right. And that's all, you know, you know, right. whereas me, I've had a life before and I, I, and I want to have a life afterwards. And, and it's just. Yeah, I. I, I kind of got into that sport knowing that it was just be a chapter whereas for the champion it's 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 but it must be even harder for them it must be like so hard well they do have the money though that makes it easier <laughs> <laughs> but still when you can imagine you have like a 20 year long career of just playing tennis every day every just like all the time and winning and winning and winning and at some point like you, you your body says no more you're like Roger Federer and your body says, you're, dude, you're 40, 42. Like, yeah. you can still win a few because you're so good that you can still win a few. But what would be the point? So now it's like time to retire. What do you do, man? What do you actually, what does Roger Federer think in the morning when he wakes up? I don't know. What's his life? What's the life of Roger Federer right now that he's, that he's retired for like a year or so? It's fascinating. I'd like to interview him and find it's out. That's a great question. Yeah. 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 This after you've already, you've already you've already climbed to the top, you've climbed to the absolute top of uh of one of you know, tennis is a very popular sport, right? Like you've climbed to the top, you are number one in the world, and then you end your career. And what do you do after that? What do you do after that that gets you excited, that gets you fired up? Um, and maybe the answer is that it might be fun to be new at something again. It might be um, because that's a big part of this, right? Is like challenges are what get us excited. Challenges are what light a fire under us. And when you're climbing that mountain and you haven't reached the top yet, you've got more to prove. You've got more to climb. You've got more to do. But once you've reached the top and you're there, you know, you'll, you'll have to speak to that, uh, or I'll interview Roger Federer and talk to him too. But, but then you look around and like, okay, what now? I could envision a scenario in which you and or Roger Federer uh, hang up your 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 gloves or whatever in your uh, respective sport, and you and you start over with something new, a new challenge. You know. Yeah, that's pretty much uh, that. That's pretty much the only thing that you can do because you can't go back to being a tennis player. You have to have uh, a different life now. But it, I think it's probably even worse for him because he he was like. Probably the greatest on par with Djokovic. Um, accomplished so much, was so loved, uh, played beautifully, and now he has all the money in the world. And like, again, what are you gonna do? I mean, at least me, I can still, you know, <laughs> try and earn some money, and I have I have a house that I want to renovate, and it's not like I can like pay a bunch of people to renovate it because you know it's bike packing so i didn't get rich doing it that's for <laughs> sure but yeah so he has to find new challenges he has to have to have somehow he had this life that was so exciting for 20 20 or so years that he was so focused and then he he and it's the same for all the champions then at some point you're not you can't be as focused and the challenges that are not there but you still have your life to live and you need to find a way to live that life. And you need to find a way to be excited about things that, let's face it, are not as exciting as becoming the greatest of anything. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be hard to beat. And you said in your um, Instagram Instagram caption uh, that, uh, what was it? Oh, I have it here. No one. Yeah. No one wakes that up was, in the morning. That was the part I was looking for. That was the part I was looking for. You yeah. nailed it. You don't, you don't wake up in the morning looking at your trophies and be like, wow, yeah. I'm good. No, but nobody does that. I don't, I, don't really, I don't really believe that Nadal or Federer or Jordan or Cristiano Ronaldo, I don't believe they wake up in the morning and they look at their trophies like, yeah, 
I'm the man. Nobody does that. It's done. It's done now. Yeah, that was good. That was good when you were doing it. Yeah. It was good when you were like right after the, the final, you were holding the trophy. That's, that's what you were looking for. That's the, that's the moment, you know. But once the trophies are on, on, on the shelf, you don't, just don't, you don't look at them. You, know, you, you, you don't wake up in the morning thinking about the past. Or if you do that, then you have a problem, I think. You need to think about either the present or the future, not the past. Yeah, I can't imagine, especially somebody who's at the top of their game, ever looking backwards. You don't get uh, you don't get better by looking backwards, right? Uh, yeah. The only the only thing looking backwards is good for is learning from what you did and learning how you can improve. But um, I've got to imagine all eyes are on moving forward. You brought up an interesting point about you know you versus other professional athletes. Because you're right, in a lot of these sports, you start at five, six years old, and it is all you know how to do. Um, it's your whole life. It always has been your whole life, and you don't really know anything else. And so maybe they're not as conflicted with uh, with the same perspective that you have, right? Like maybe that's all they know, and they don't deal with thoughts of what comes after until maybe they, they get to that point. But... Um, you, like you said, you got into bike pack racing, uh, quite a bit later in life. You'd already done a, I know you did a lot of bike touring and lived a full life before you ever got into bike pack racing. And, um, I'm wondering like what has sustained your motivation? What has attracted you to this sport and what has lit a fire um, up until this point, like what is, what have been those things that really keeps you going? Um, yeah. And I, I have to assume it's not just winning. Maybe it is, maybe it is, but it's, it's, yeah, there's, there's a bit of a paradox there because even if right now I'm not super excited or motivated, I have not yet reached that stage where you, you actually do that thing and you don't enjoy it anymore. I still enjoy being in a race and I still enjoy performing and racing. So, so I, that's why I don't think it's actually time for me to retire. Um, because even though I guess only the people that, that race bike packing understand why it's so enjoyable, um, it is, it really is something very special. And, I guess that's why I've 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 kept doing it. It's and it's it's a mix of just loving the the time spent on the bike, loving just the purity of that almost constant forward movement and and that obsession was just like yeah, constantly moving forward and not caring about ab- anything else at all that just like t- takes you out of any sort of, of, of life that you might have, um, whatever you do outside of, of bike packing and where, where just like for the time that you are on the bike, like it just makes sense all the time. It's just like everything has a meaning because the, 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 the goal is just to keep moving. And that's, that's why I think it's like, it's that, that bike pack racing is so, so special because it's just like everything is like concentrated everything that you love about about bikepacking about you know being you know being on a trip and going to that place and then to that place like it's just this times a hundred or a thousand so it's it's very special and for me especially doing that and 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 doing that with the goal of winning and doing it, um, being in the lead and doing it faster than anyone else. That's even better. That's, I mean, I like the, the, the actual, you know, uh, bike riding, the long, hard days on the bike, but doing it faster than anyone that has signed up for the race. It's, it's even better. It's just like, it makes things t- taste so good. It's just so special. 
So that's why I keep doing it. And that's why, and that's why like after, after any, I mean, I would say starting, starting 2019 when I, when I won my first race, it was either I, I would win a race and then I would, I would be chasing that feeling Again, not the feeling of winning, but the feel the feeling of leading. Either I would not win, I would finish second. And then I would I would just like want to wash it off with a win. And be like, I don't want to stay on that on that, that second place. I wanna I wanna get a win and just forget about not winning. So it was it was a cycle. It was a cycle of either, oh yeah, that winning, well, racing. And leading this race felt so good. I don't feel like that again. Or oh yeah, I didn't I didn't win this one. So I need to win the next one and prove that actually, yeah, it was I can still win. So and probably, you know what, if I were to sign up, I mean I don't know, because because you know, the more I do it, the more I need some of some of the races where I, I just I just yeah, step my foot up the gas a little bit, and even though I I still uh, um, finish here yeah, top five or top ten because density of the races, you know, sometimes it's not that high. So even by racing at I don't know eighty or or seventy five percent of my potential, I still manage to to post uh, somewhat of a good result. Um. Yeah, it's just so mentally taxing that that I can't do it. I, can, I even though I love racing, I just like I can't do it. You know, four or five times a year, full 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 blast, just full gas. Because um, again, as as you said, you need to want it really, really, really bad. And if it's just if it's just like a, a small a smaller race, you know, not not a high profile competition, then it's just it's just hard. Because what are you going to prove by winning a race where? Very few people are competing, or where uh, no one is actually at your level. So it's 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 just not very motivating, and 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 sometimes like okay, maybe I can just be here and uh, and um, and have a good time. Yeah, I think I'll ret- I think I'll retire when when I I am after actually being out on a race and not not enjoying myself. Hmm. Well, I'm glad to hear you're not retiring. Um, I I want to. Um, I had this 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 idea, right? Something I know about you, and and I think you just referenced it is like you like being at the front of the race. Being at the front of a race is a, a place of comfort for you. You probably get some enjoyment out of it. Um, it's exhilarating. A lot of pressure on you to perform. I'm putting words in your mouth, but. You know, I want to zoom out. So I, I know that about you. I know you like leading races, but right now you're leading bike pack racing. You're at the top of this sport. And, it's, you know, you're struggling to find the motivation to find the same level of joy and, and the fire that you had at previous races. And you're having this dialogue with yourself. What's different about leading a race versus leading? a sport why is this not as exciting well it's 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 factual you know when you're like right mm. now you say i'm leading a sport i know i'm i'm i know i'm at the top i know i'm i'm uh, among the best but there can be a debate you know it's debatable who's who's the actual best is it me? Is it like would I would I win a bike packing race against Lachlan Morton, for example? I don't know. You don't know. He doesn't know. Probably depends on the distance. Probably depends on the terrain. Maybe he does not. Maybe it would bit me anywhere. I don't know. <laughs> so there's it's 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 different. It's a debate. It's a debate of who's who's the actual who's the actual best. It can be me. It can be. It can be Lachlan, it can be Ulrich, it can be, um, I don't know, I'm running out of names, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got, I, I got nothing to offer. I mean, I think Lachlan is is an interesting conversation to have, but um, 
Yeah, you're the most winningest uh, person uh, right now in, in bike pack racing. So that's one way to look at it. But you're right. I mean, that's a nuanced question. And we would have to get every single elite bike pack racer, endurance racer on the same race at the exact same time and uh, and run that. And we'd probably have to run that 10 times to see who came yeah, out on top exactly. the most times, right? Because there's mechanicals, there's weather, there's all kinds of challenges. Um, so, yeah, I mean... I, it is certainly debatable for sure, but and to, um, and to keep on answering your question, yeah, it's 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 like I said, uh, you don't wake up in the morning thinking about you know I'm the best backpacker in the world. That's not what happens. I don't I don't go to bed at night and I don't wake up in the morning raising my arms like yeah I'm the best backpacker in the world. That's not what I do. Whereas when you're leading a race, you are actually riding your bike and you know you're ahead of everyone and you know they're chasing you and you know you're trying to get away and you know that the finish line is over there and your goal is to get there first. And it's, you know, it's an actual, it's just, it's just your day to day. It's just like, it's not even just your day to it's your minute to minute. You know, it's like, it's your only, it's the only horizon is reaching that, that line and reaching it first and it's and you just keep on thinking about yeah i I, i'm i'm there i'm getting there i'm gonna get there first so that's why it's it's different you know you know being the leader of race being at the top of a discipline i don't think it's it it actually uh, um i don't think the two are related i don't think they feel the same yeah It, it makes a lot of sense actually um it's a it's a much different thing to actually be in the moment versus um, kind of the day to day minutia of of being number one and and continue to work towards number one. Um, yeah, it's it's quite a bit different. This is this is a, an interesting topic, and I'm glad that we're discussing it. And I when I read your post, I never had the inclination. Uh, it's just not my personality to hop on and tell you what I think about what you should be doing. Uh, my inclination is, is to ask you, like you, you're sitting in this position and whether you're number one or not is, I mean, I guess there's some nuance and we could debate that, but regardless of positioning in the bike pack racing world, you have accomplished, um, more than you ever set out to do. And you're now looking around, and 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 wondering how to keep it exciting i'm wondering what ideas you've come up with like one thing we all love about you is like you're a unique and authentic uh interesting thoughtful person you're you're endlessly entertaining to watch on a bike and you approach it in your own unique way i don't know i assume that what you're looking for now is is a way to to do that at this stage in your career and I'm wondering if you've had any ideas. Are, are you? Is there anything that is getting you excited? Is there a new way to frame what you're doing that is uh, bringing you joy and excitement, or is it just, let's say, you put in your, you you said in your post, this is a season of doubt, or this is a time of doubt, or are you just kind of shrouded with doubt at the moment? Yeah, it's it it is a time of doubt. That that is for sure, and it is. Uh, I know I'm closer to the end of my career than to the beginning. That is for sure. And it's, just, it's not just my age because, I mean, it's, it's bikepacking. So you can do, you look at JP and you know that you can do great things even at, at you know, 47, 48, 49, 50. So it's not, it's not the question. It's, it's not just the age, but I know I'm de- uh, definitely nearing the end of my career. Um. Mm-hmm. Again, because of motivation more than anything else. I still have, as I said, a few boxes that I want to tick. Um, especially, I, um, that's always, there's always challenges, you know. Uh, I don't think that what's going to happen from now on is going to define my legacy. Uh, my legacy is, has been defined now. I mean, three... Silk Road Mountain Race, one Atlas, one one Tour Divide, and and you know other stuff. So, but um, I'm 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 passionate about bike packing. I um, I love I love the sport. I love the community, and I love 
uh, having a connection to the history of the sport. And this is why I was so obsessed with, with Tour Divide for so long. Um, it's because, you know, it's, it's the granddaddy. Uh, and the same way I want to connect with the history of, of bikepacking uh, by racing the original races, you know, um, Arizona Trail Race, Colorado Trail Race, uh my 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 friend uh tim tate resurrected the grand loop uh it seems like it seems like a crazy challenge you know mm. and it's 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 not the kind of it's not the kind of challenge that that defines your legacy but it's just like it feels so interesting to to connect with uh with the origin of the origins of the sport and just like to to get a feel of yeah, but some of, I mean, a race can be legendary for different reasons. It can be legendary even for the second edition, like Silk Road, you know, because it's like so extreme and so beautiful that it was in like an instant classic, you know, or it can be, it can be legendary because it's just incredibly long or incredibly hard, or it can be legendary because it's been around, around for years. And when you, when you have races like AZT, like CTR, they have, I think, they have a special meaning in the in the in the history of bikepacking because they they've been around for the longest. Uh, these are races that I still have not raced, so there's there's definitely an interest here for, for me. Um, I do intend on racing uh, AZT next year. Ooh. Uh, I I don't really have uh, any plans about CTR at the moment because uh, CTR is a bit. Is a bit different uh, in the in the fact that um, for me going to Arizona, since it's a, it's a longer race, it's quite it's it's you know it's it's going to be about spending quite some time uh, uh, out there on on a on a really tough and slow course. So it makes sense um, going on such a long trip to spend that much time outside. Whereas CTR. Is much shorter. It's still a long trip from uh, from uh, Europe, so as I would just I would need to find a way somehow to to justify that trip with you know CTR and maybe some of the stuff. So it's just like logistically uh, 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 a bit more complicated. So I'm just gonna set my set my eyes on uh, on AZ AZ Chief next year. Um, and um, and yeah, as you know, uh, this year I raced uh, Highland Trail 550. Uh, I couldn't really race it to uh, the full extent of my ability because I had been bitten by a dog in Greece a couple weeks prior to the start of the race. So I had, had no training at all. And um, so I, just, I went to Scotland. I was absolutely amazed by how beautiful it is. Um, and I, uh, I got to, I got to know the course. I got to know the event. Um, and now I want to go there and, 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 and do my best and win it because let's face it. I don't, uh, my, my goal is never to just do my best. Uh, my goal is always to win. That's other people's and goals. I a... <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I, I don't, you know me, I don't like to be a hypocrite. That's, yeah, I, mean, I'm a, I love it. Yeah, I don't like it. I just like I don't. I know that. It's, I mean, in the U.S., you have a different state of mind. In the, in the U.S., people are actually allowed to to say when they have an ambition and when they you and you know the kind of goal that they want to reach and and the fact that they want to be on top. It's just like it's not taboo over there. Whereas mm. here, you, you kind of need to have that fake humility. You need to kind of be humble, but for the sake, for the sake of it, and and it's false. You know, it's just like it's just like pretend. Um, whereas, like, I don't like that. I don't like that. I just it is. I've, I've always been adamant about the fact that I race to win. So any race that I set my eyes on, the goal is the same. It, it's just to win. Um, so. Oh, Whereas, you know, some athletes, especially I would, th- I, would, I would say in Europe, 
would be like, yeah, I just want to do my best. It's like, also, you know, when you say you, I want to do my best, less pressure, much less pressure on your, on your shoulders when you want just to want, want to do your best. Because 100%. You just, you just, you just finish, I don't know, you know, second, third, fifth, whatever you finish like, yeah, well, I did my best. Good man. Yep. Good on you. You've met your goal. That's what, that's what, that's, yeah, if that's what I would, you, you set out to do and you did great. That no, no pressure at all. I, that's not what I do. I want to win. Yeah. So doing my, doing my best, not enough. Doing my, doing my best, not enough. This is Um, why you're a treasure. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, it's just. No, man, you're, 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 you can, you, you the thing is you can, you can, you can filter what you say to have more people like you to actually, you know, like you love you or whatever. Uh, you can do that, but what's the point? What's the point? You know? Yeah, uh, because I'd rather, then who- I'd rather say what's on my heart and, and, and have some people like, I don't know, I don't like him, he's arrogant. I don't know, maybe I am, or maybe I'm not, maybe I'm just realist that I, I actually want these races. Is that arrogance? No. I don't think so. I, I want them. It's yeah. just like I didn't want them by accident. That would, be, that would be a lot of accidents. So I don't think that you need to pretend to and it's not it gets, it's not about humility because i think you can be successful and humble at the same time but right yeah i think, I think you're you, a humble you, person i think I yeah I'm a humble person. I just, <laughs> <laughs> maybe i am maybe i'm not well i think but, you know honesty is a big part of humility right like you are very honest you're very authentic to who you are and i think that has to at least in my mind dovetail really closely with some level of humility um or maybe it's just pure honesty um but it's relatable to people um at least in america i don't know about the french audience we'll see how they take to it <laughs> but uh i don't know there's, but, there's i feel there's something at the culture in in france where it's it's almost shameful to want to be successful you know and it's almost um like yeah, I mean, in the U.S., when you're the best and you say you're the best, well, if it's a fact, people are like, yeah. He's, he's, when Michael Jordan says he's the best, people are like, yeah, Michael Jordan is the best. That's what he is. But I, I, I think that if a French athlete would were to say, yeah, I am the best, even if he, even if he's proven that he's the best, then he would, he was, he will just, I don't know. This, I don't think it's, it's something that people are ready to hear in France. I don't. I think there's something about some sort of yeah. Need to be modest, even though it's 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 not real. Yeah, false modesty. Extra modest. Yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, Sofian, you're the one who has to live uh, in your body and in your skin and uh, deal with you know life in the way that makes sense to you. And you know the way I the way I look at it is. When you are authentic to yourself, when you present yourself in an authentic way, you know, online, through your racing, through podcasts, whatever it may be, you're doing yourself a favor because you're giving yourself the freedom to just be yourself, right? Like if you are, are trying to hold yourself to a standard that is unrealistic for yourself, some social norms that you feel like you need to uh, abide by to, you know, get more Instagram followers, then you're stuck being that person, right? Like you can't ever get out of being that person. And so I think there's a great freedom in just in being who you are and, um, you know, uh, and I, I appreciate it. You know, it's why I, I'm always eager to talk to you and hear what, what you're thinking, what's on your mind, what, you know, how did that race go? Because, um, you're, you're always a very insightful and a thoughtful person and you're always very honest, um, with the way that you portray whatever it is that you're going through, whether it's winning a race or whether it's, you know, grappling with, um, you, you know, accomplishing so much in the sport and you look around, you're like, now what, you know, those are honest conversations. Those are honest reflections. And, um, regardless of people's inability to themselves be authentic and present themselves in an authentic way, I think that, 
we are very, very attracted to other people who are able to do that, um, who are able to, you know, a lot of us sing on bike rides, but we're not willing to uh, post it on social media when we're singing Lionel Richie or whatever, you know, like, uh, but it, it, it endears you to people because they, it's relatable, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, I do that, too, you know, and that that makes it relatable. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, you've talked a lot about how hard this is, uh, on the toll that it takes on, on you. And, um, I'm very curious if you could, you know, take us behind the scenes of what is it like? What has it taken? What sacrifices have you made to your body, your brain, your, your life outside of bike pack racing? At what expense has it taken to become at the top, the top bike pack racer in the world, arguably? I don't think that my body has taken a big toll, at least not at the moment. Maybe later down the, the road, I'll pay for this. I hope not. Um, yeah, maybe just a few... Uh, a few dysfunctions in uh, in my hands, you know, due to the the, the pressures uh, on the ulnar nerve. Uh, sometimes uh, my my uh, some of my fingers get stuck, um, stuff like that, or uh, some uh, 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 scar tissue. Uh, um, a few, well, yeah, some some, some scars, obviously, on, on my body from. Uh, from uh, different uh, crashes, uh, falls, or, or dog bites. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> my sleep, I've, I, 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 was, I was an insomniac before, before starting. Uh, uh, and I think it's worse now. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just I, I think the, the biggest toll that it took is like, now, when I set it, set out on a on a on a bike packing race, I know I how, how hard it's gonna be, mm. and and sometimes I just if I don't feel it like right right away, it's like I just like instantly give up. Like what 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 happened uh, last year on the Rhino Run? I uh, the 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 first night I was I was pushing my, my bike um, up. Uh, rocky steep just very cold climb it was i don't know two or three a.m and i stopped and i was like this is this is how it's gonna be i know i know what it's gonna be i know what it's gonna t- what it takes to clear that kind of hike bike and i know how it takes what i know what it takes to ride through 10 or 11 hours of darkness and miss out on the landscapes and being cold. And, and then I was like, I don't have it. The kind of, the kind of resolve that you need, the toughness, the mental toughness, the kind, the, the ability to dig as deep. Now I instantly know if I, for an event, if I have it or not. Because it's not, it's, it's nothing new. It's at this point, it's nothing new. It's just like I just need to go back to that memory of mine. It's like a bank, you know. It's like, oh yeah, I remember how 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 it is. And I feel like if you have that motivation, that hunger that I had for, for things like uh, Tour de Vida or Silk Road, then that experience is is going to help you. But if you don't have it, that that experience is is just it's just gonna slow you down because you're gonna be like, oof, the times that are coming are gonna be super challenging, and I don't want to go through that kind of stuff. I don't wanna, I wanna, you know, end up, um, whatever, hypothermic, um, sleep deprived, hungry, depleted. And every kilometer or every mile is gonna is just gonna be hell. And it's like, why? Why would I inflict that to myself for the sake of which line 
on on my uh, on my resume you know there's already there's i have enough on my resume at the moment that i don't need to inflict this to myself so but yeah i just i don't know the the toll that it took yeah again as i said i i just hope that I'm not going to be like early Alzheimer from all the lack of sleep, all the sleep deprivation. <laughs> oh, no. Like, yeah, I hope not. That would, suck. that would really suck. I would be like, mm, yeah, maybe I should have done something else with my life. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully all of the, um, you know, the excite. you know, your brain is being so stimulated at the same time when you're in a new place, you have all these logistical challenges, there's unforeseen things that come to the picture. And the same way you play games with your phone to, you know, get your brain activated, your brain is very stimulated during those races at the same time. So maybe it balances itself out. Maybe, maybe it just balances yeah, itself yeah, out. Yeah. I want to, I want to. <laughs> I don't want to look too deep in the in the, the <laughs> potential consequences because yeah because I don't want to if it's if it's bad I don't want to know because I want to keep doing yeah. it for a little bit so <laughs> yeah well then we won't dig too deep into that let's yeah, dig yeah, let's, let's let's just let's just pretend that it's very healthy let's be optimist it's fine this yeah. is the best thing you can we're be both, doing for your body and your brain so let's yeah. let's do our thing of thinking that everything is gonna be all right. It is. It is. Let's let's Usually take the focus to uh, what it, what does it take to be the what does it take to be Sofian Sahili in your day day to day life? Um, your training, your food, nutrition. You know what what kind of sacrifices? Like how hard are you working? How much of your life is dedicated to this? What are you doing in your day to day life so you can show up and even give yourself? Because, like you just said, like you got to have it. You got to have that that hunger, that drive, that mental thing where you're like, okay, I'm gonna go and endure this really, really hard thing. But before you ever get to that point, you got to get yourself there, and you got to put yourself in a position to to potentially win. Honestly, it's pretty easy. <laughs> it's, it's. I think. I think it's much easier than having a nine to five job in an office. Nine to five job in an office. You need to wake up at you know. Depends on your commute, but seven thirty, eight, whatever. I wake up whenever I want. I never yeah. put a, I, this. I never put an alarm. I like. I kind of. I wake up. Then it depends on where I am. Uh, basically, being Sofia and Sayili, uh training is just traveling. Training is just bike packing. I don't really have like a coach or structured training or, you know, my nutrition's like. The good thing about bike packing is like nutrition is not that important. The, the the really important thing is like to be to have a stomach that is able to handle food that comes from pretty much anywhere in the world, food that comes from a gas station in Wyoming or some uh, some little shop in uh, in Morocco or in Kyrgyzstan. If your if your stomach can handle that can handle that, then you're good to go for bike packing. And then yeah, it's just like I try I tried. As as I as I described my uh, my year uh, uh, earlier in the podcast, yeah, uh, last year I, I went on several trip with my girlfriend, so we were, we were just uh, bike packing, and then maybe um, during uh, one of these rides, I would I would have some little intervals, like oh yeah, this climb I'm gonna go full gas on this climb, just like try and keep stay in stay in shape. But you don't actually even need to do that when you ride every day on when you're on a bike packing trip. Like uh, we were in course, we were in Corsica, then we were in uh, Southeast Asia and stuff like that. So um, yeah, then now it's off season. Uh, my I don't really know when my uh, next race is going to be. It was probably going to be in end of, end of May in um, in uh, Scotland. So now being Sofian Zaley is just renovating a house. So. <laughs> It's, uh, <laughs> I don't have a car though. So I have a cargo bike and I do everything, uh, I do everything by bike, either, either with my, uh, my road bike or my cargo bike. So that's, that's, uh, that keeps me in shape. That makes sure that, uh, I'm, uh, I'm always riding. And then, yeah, if I, if when, uh, uh, a race, uh, uh, is like right around the corner, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna maybe ride. Not necessarily more, but harder. But these are just short periods, you know, probably like little training blocks, probably like two weeks, 10 days long. 
So it's it's it doesn't take a lot of dedication to be a bikepacking champion. Actually, it's much easier than being Roger Federer or Michael Jordan. So is it harder? Uh, is the real challenge actually in the race itself? Um, yeah. To push yourself that hard, yeah. That's yeah, where yeah, the real challenge that, comes in. The, the specificity of bikepacking is like there's so much that is that is in your head. It is so much that, it, and there's so much that is about how much you want it, you know. And this, I think, I, I'm pretty sure this is why I won the Silk Road this year. I, I, I don't know that I was the best athlete out there. I don't know that I was the the fastest bike packer. But damn, I want it more than anyone else. That is for sure. I know that. I know that for a fact that I wanted to win this race more than any uh, uh, of the other guys there. And that's, that's what made the difference in the end. And that's what you need. You need, you need the ability to push yourself just to, to, to exhaustion, the ability to like stay on the bike until you cannot physically stay on the bike, until you're just like falling asleep and if you stay on the bike, you just and you're just gonna end up in the ditch, and so you stop and you actually take a nap. But that's what you need. That's you don't need to be like the fastest cyclist. You, you need to be the one that is like the hungriest, the thirsty, thirst, thirstiest. So take us, take us to the Silk Road, for example. Um, you're in second place. You're right behind Justin and uh, I can't remember the gentleman who was right behind you, but Jakob, you know, Jakob, thank you. And uh, with specificity, where, what are you tapping into? What is your thought process? What are you thinking to yourself that keeps you pushing forward when you don't want to until you're about to fall over on your bike? Like, where do you go? What are you tapping into that, Keeps you pushing, man. Losing is is not an option. Losing is, and losing for me is like second place is losing. I know that for a lot of people, second place is great, and it is, in a way, great. But for me, not being first is losing. And this is something that I hate. I don't want this to happen. It's not that I just absolutely want to win. It's just that I absolutely do not want to lose. <laughs> it's almost different. It's the same thing, but it's almost different. Yeah, yeah. But it's just it's just that sometimes you don't have an you don't you don't have a choice. Sometimes you're not the best and you don't you end up not winning. But I push myself as much as I can because just no, 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 no. Winning is the only option. Losing, it, it can't happen. It just can't happen because that would be a disaster. That would be like a complete, a total disaster. And it's not, and I'm not, I'm, uh, of course, now that I'm sitting here with you chatting uh, over the internet on a podcast, I do know that it's actually, it's not an actual disaster. Nice. I have enough, of, enough of, of an understanding of the situation, but when I am in the context of the race, when I'm on my bike, I am, I am, I am blind to the fact that it is, it is not the end of the world. It, it, it is almost like it's the actual end of the world when, when, when I'm riding in, and I, and actually, you know what? If you if we go back to Silk Road, I was there. I was convinced that I was going to win, even when I was in second place chasing Justin. I was like, I'm I'm, I don't know that I'm going to win, but I'm convinced that I am. It was it, it's it's a, it's a nuance, but it's still it's still two things that are different. So yeah. I was convinced that I was going to win, and it was an obsession. It, it was the only thing that I could think about. It was just winning, winning, winning. And then at some point, I was like, maybe you should think about 
what's going to happen if you don't win because it's a, it's a possibility even though you're convinced that you're going to win the reality of things is that there is the, there is the world there is a universe where you don't actually win this race it's not impossible so maybe you should start thinking of this and you know what i could not i could not envision a scenario whereas where I was not winning this race. I refused. My brain refused to think about something else than a victory. Hmm. I could not. I'm, I've, I'm, I've, I have well, a good imagination. Yeah. <laughs> but this I was unable to do. That's fascinating. I just is because no, because no, you can't. You can't even like let you th- yourself think about the option of. Right, it's not an option. It's completely off the table. Yeah, it is. It is. Is this? Yes, it's, is, it's, 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 it's sorry. Yeah. Uh, is is this speak to who you are? Have you always been like this? The not not just the will to win, but the will to not lose. Or is this something you learned about yourself and found um, in the sport of bike pack racing? This is this is completely new to me. Hmm. This is like completely new. Like I had no idea it was like that before starting by pack racing that's crazy i just like like no idea i was not into sports i was not into competition i had never actually yeah competed uh in 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 any sport so i didn't know that i was like that i just discovered that uh when i when i started uh backpack racing i discovered that i was i was not and also i became like that I became like that by winning and winning and winning. Um, mm-hmm. It's just like it. It. I built. I built that. That. Uh, I built that. Uh, of course, I started by being uh, fairly competitive when my with my first race, and then with um, subsequent races, and then the first wins. Then it was. It just got. It's. It's a. It's a trait of my personality that just like got stronger and stronger. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, what has been your most devastating loss? And I'm including second, third, fourth, fifth place. And when I say loss, what has been the 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 race that really ate you up or was really devastating uh, to not come out on top? Um, it was uh, directly after the Atlas Mountain Race. So basically, the way that things happened is in 2019, I won the Italy Divide. Um, then I went to Tour Divide. I was leading when I dropped out uh, right after the Brush Mountain Lodge. Then I went to Inca Divide and I won it. Then I went to uh, Atlas Mountain Race and I won it. So I was not really on a three race winning streak because there was the tour divide in between, but the tour divide, I didn't feel like I had lost it because I wasn't good enough. I felt like I, I dropped out because I was the, the, I was not racing on my terms because it felt, it's, it felt like really dangerous. It felt like, like, uh, uh, I, uh, I could, and it was actually our first podcast. Uh, the first time that we recorded the podcast, podcast together, yep. I was at mm-hmm. Rush Mountain Lodge. And we, yeah. I know. Um, so cool. Yeah. So people, like, if you want to understand what, what happened during Tour Divide, you go back to, to that episode of Bike, Bikes or Death. Um, but basically, it was like the last four races, every time I chose to keep going, so three times out of four, I chose to keep going and ended up, I ended up winning. And, and after that, I raced the Hope 1000 in Switzerland. So it's a, a 1,000 kilometer long um, uh, off-road bikepacking race with a ton of elevation. And I was sure that I was going to win because because I, I, I was on that almost uh, three uh, race winning streak and um and i did not and and i remember i remember really well and i will always remember the the so 
I was third for a long time. And uh, the, the guy was the, at the front, Jochen, uh, a German, German uh, racer, um, was, I would say, roughly usually three to four hours ahead of me. Um, and every, every night, I was sure that, uh, that I would pass him during the night because I, I kept riding and riding and riding, and I never slept. And at some point, I realized that he was also sleeping very little. And then towards the end of the race, I realized that there's not, there's no, not, a, there's not going to be enough time for me to, uh, to make up the, the, the gap that he had built. And when I realized that, I almost cried, actually. I almost cried. And I, I, <laughs> I, I thought about my, didn't really think about my followers. I thought about my girlfriend. I thought about like, She's so convinced that I'm the best, and right now I am not being the best, and I'm just ashamed. I'm just ashamed that I am not winning this race, and it was devastating. It was devastating to to not win, to to get to that race, pretty much promising her that I would come home with another victory, and then realizing that I, I hadn't done enough. I hadn't been fast enough. I didn't, uh, uh, I don't know, just, I didn't, I wasn't the best at that. And on that race, Jochen was just better than me. And I have no problem admitting it. He's, he's like, I have no excuse. I, I don't need to make an excuse. I went, I went to that race with <coughs> my, my 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 background my my training whatever my skills and they were they were just not enough and and but when i realized it towards the end of the race i think probably the the third day or something like that it was the race that, that lasted around four days then when i realized that i was not going to catch him that it was not going to happen that it was just faster just the uh I'm like whoa that hurts that really hurts yeah what uh let's segue to one of your best races um since we're all positive people around here you said in your post that silk road 2023 your third time to win it was about as perfect as a race could be um what does that mean to you what does a perfect race look like to you and and what made that race perfect or almost perfect i think well it's it's racing on your own terms it's like not um doing things looking at 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 uh, your your positioning and and who's who's chasing you who's ahead of you and i think that i can do it now that i have built enough confidence that i can beat pretty much anyone so now especially in kyrgyzstan on the silk road i'm out there um i know i know the country i know the course um, I know it takes its toll for all the riders, and uh, I know that I'm very, very hard to beat. So I just do my thing. And a few times, uh, actually, I was close to Justin. I saw Justin like um, at checkpoint. Uh, was yeah, checkpoint two. I I I got there an hour and a half after him, and I saw him leave. And the old me would have been like, whoa, if it keeps on riding, I need to keep on riding as well. But I was like, it's a long race. He's going to maybe he's going to build a, a bit of a lead right now. But I don't care. I'll catch him at some point. And it, it happened again. Uh, we got together. I think it was towards the midway point of the race in a, in a, in a small town. And I decided to sleep in a hotel. And he decided to keep going. And again, I was at peace with this decision. I was like, well, when I'm, when I'm going to wake up in a few hours, it'll be ahead. But again, there's, there's a long way to go. I'll catch him at some point. And so having that, that confidence that I now um, race um, the way that I know how with my strengths and that when I need to step my foot on the gas and I need to cut back on sleep, then I do it. Um, 
And so I, I did what I wanted to do in that race. So it means that uh, when I wanted to stop, I stopped. When I wanted to sleep, I did. And when it was time to cut back on sleep, I did it. And yeah, I didn't really have any moment where I thought I, I'd made a wrong decision or lost or lost time. Of course, there's still going to be a few tiny mistakes here and there. It's some, some things that are out of your control. But yeah, it's, it, it comes very close to perfection in that I didn't, didn't oversleep, didn't either undersleep, you know, uh, or maybe, or, yeah, maybe once. So. <laughs> but yeah, slept in the right places, uh, didn't pass up on opportunities to stay indoors, um, didn't lose uh, 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 time for, uh, for stupid stuff. Uh, and just like, yeah, was, was constantly on the bike, focused, pedaling, moving forward, um, and, 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 and playing on my strength, which is, uh, being able to go with, uh, on very little sleep. Uh, and, and I was, I know it was not riding as, as fast as Jakub who, who, who finished second, but, um, but yeah, the last, the last stretch of when we were very close, uh, to together, then, he had no other choice than cutting back on sleep like me because he hadn't he, the only way i think that he could have won this race is if he would have passed me um before the last 24 hours because he needed a head start or he needed more sleep but the thing is when we find ourselves uh the both of us with the same uh, lack of sleep, then I was faster because he's not used to that to to riding in that in, in that state. He's used to sleeping more and then riding harder. And by doing that, sleeping more and riding harder, he, he managed to pretty much be, uh, um, yeah. Before the last 24 hours, we were, I think, seven kilometers apart. And that's what he managed to do. And then he was there and he knew that if we were to sleep four to six hours, then I would build too big of a gap for him to, to, to close even by riding super fast. So he had no choice. He cut back on sleep. I did cut back on sleep too, but that's what I usually do. And, and it was enough. It was enough, and uh, and I think it was it was a perfect race in that I um, I slept uh, I slept the right amount in the right places, and I never really lost time anywhere. I didn't uh, messed up my resupplies and stuff like that. Always had food when I needed food. Um, always had water when I needed water, and uh, I didn't have uh, stupid well no stupid mechanicals and stuff like that. So yeah, close to perfect. What yeah. What about, um, at the very, very beginning of the race, you had a crash that, um, took out your cell phone. Um, which, which to me sounds daunting, right? Like your cell phone allows you to know where other people are at the track leaders. You can call your girlfriend or text her, get messages from friends. Um, I'm curious how that impacted your race, uh, if at all, or, or maybe you're, you know, exactly what you need to do and it doesn't matter where the other dots are and you're just going to go, um, perform the way you need to. But to me, that sounds daunting, uh, to, to lose your cell phone at the very beginning of a long and hard race. Yeah, it, it, I, I, I would, I'm not going to say that I freaked out when I found out that my phone was broken, but, uh, for sure I was, I was worried. I was worried. Um, but I managed the, the, the bigger problem is to know where you are and to know where you are is pretty important because to know mm. where you are, that's, that's, that's how you build your strategy and building your strategy. It might not be super important at the beginning of the race, but towards the end of the race, it's, it's crucial. Um, so, but by that time I had, I had kind of 
figured out that any time that um, there would be a village, there would be people, and then I would be able to check the tracker. Um, and the thing is, it's if there's one race where it's it's not as important to have your phone, it's probably Silk Road because it's not like you have reception all the time. You know, you're gonna you. It's actually rare that you have reception. So yeah. uh, I was not. I'm not gonna say that we're on a level playing field because they had they. It was definitely easier for them, um, but um, it's more of a level playing field than in the in the in a in a race anywhere else where, uh, or like in Morocco, for example, in the last man race, you have reception all the time. Hmm. Um, so there, I knew that I I I could check the tracker on other people's phones um, and maybe once a day. And maybe the other races could check the tracker, I don't know, twice, twice, twice a day or something. But in the end, it was it was such a close race with such strong racers that the 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 only strategy was to do your best and go as fast as you can, as sleep as little, as little as you could, you know. It's not like there was, at some point, a time where you could relax. <laughs> a time at some point where you could like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down for an hour and have a great, a big meal. You know, it's it, it was not that kind of race. It was a race where there was yeah. so there was always someone to catch or someone breathing down your neck. Yeah, it was fun to watch from the dot water dot watchers perspective. It was so tight up bit. front. Um, it was just like, holy shit, uh, what, what's going to happen? I can't imagine what it was like to actually be out there. And, um, I referenced it earlier in the podcast, but, uh, you, on your YouTube channel, you created a, a short film called a will to win uh, about your 2023, um, Silk Road. And it's a great video. It's all self-documented and, uh, very well put together and really kind of takes uh takes the viewer along for the ride you actually have a great youtube channel people should go check it out because you're putting out a lot of um a lot of just like really good content um after your silk road you actually like got on and did like a post-race recap and talked about you know your race uh right there so if you're needing more sophie on uh you got a lot more content for people let's uh what does 2024 look like for you? This episode is going to be the first episode of the new year. So everybody's making plans, making goals, making new year's resolutions. Um, you know, what, what, if any ones do you have, you mentioned the AZT, what else is on your horizon for this next year? Uh, yeah. So Hell on trail 550 is, uh, as I said, and you know, for me, it's, 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 uh, I, I just moved to the countryside in a, in a big, house uh 2024 is, is very much going to be about you know settling down here renovating um the one thing that i'm i'm uh if there's one thing that i'm really excited about is uh going back on a bike packing trip with my girlfriend uh the last the last time that we did this was um was uh, almost a year ago and um if i i'm not like Right now, I would not be super excited about going on a solo bike packing trip, but I would I would love to go on a trip with her. So, I'm yeah, I'm more you know excited about you know some other low key stuff like regular life more more than um, than bike packing uh, races and stuff like that. It's gonna happen, but it's not thing things that I that I think about a lot at the moment. I'm just like happy to to take a break from uh from um from bike pack races uh after uh, uh years that have been really intense um and i'm just happy to focus on on, on different stuff um i think that 24 is probably probably going to be probably going to be good i don't think i'm going to race as much as i as uh, as 20 uh 22 and 23 where i raced uh a whole, a whole lot but um uh, yeah, just uh, regular life is pretty cool too. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, and you just need to 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 focus on that. And uh, and yeah, like I don't know, discovering my 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 new neighborhood, cool gravel tracks around here, cool mountain bike tracks, and just like settling down here and uh, 
and uh, and we'll see with uh, what twenty twenty four brings in terms of uh, of, of uh, bike packing and uh, yeah, I don't doubt that it's going to be cool. I uh, I know that I'm just in a phase at the moment where I don't I don't ride as much, but I'm not worried. You know, it's just like you need to do what you want to do. You don't you yeah. don't need to go on a ride because you feel obligated to go on a ride. You don't need to to go on a on the long trip on the other side of the world because you feel obligated to you need to wait for um the the right moment when you actually uh, uh crave these things and i think that right now what i crave is just like uh taking care of my new home and spending quality time with my girlfriend and and yeah just 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 focus on um on just regular life yeah it sounds really nice. Um, I remember when, um, so I drove you after the tour divide for the listener after tour divide in 22, I drove you and Manu, um, from Hachita to El Paso, Texas, um, to get, um, so you could get on your airplane. Um, but during that, that trip, we talked about a lot of things. One of the things that we discussed is you were telling me about this dream, this goal that you had of, of buying a house in the countryside and, um, and you've now done that. So, uh, why don't you tell me about your house? It sounds, it sounds cool. I'm happy for you. I'm happy that you, um, yeah, I'm happy that you, you kind of put that piece of the puzzle in, in, uh, together. Uh, so what is that looking like? What, where'd you, where'd yeah, you land? So it's, it's in, uh, in the Southwest of France uh it's uh in a in a region called uh, that is formerly called the Kersi, which is now called the lot uh and it's a really old uh farm that dates back from uh 1854 it's uh it's it's made of stone like solid stone like thick ass walls uh and i've uh, i have a bunch of land uh quite a big land the house is pretty big, so uh, I don't know uh, square foot, but it's uh, 150 square meters. So, uh, and the land is uh, almost, uh, I don't know if acres is right, but uh-huh. I don't know, in, uh, in, um, in square meters, that's uh, seven, 17,000. So pretty big piece of land. Uh, I have a pool swimming pool oh dang (laughs) it's not that i was looking for a house with a swimming pool but i was looking for a house with it with some land and a quiet place and then we ended up finding this one and i was like it has a pool all right i'll keep it up it can it can be useful um but yeah this this there's a bunch of work to be done on the house um and uh yeah so i'm uh i'm quite the handy man actually so I'm uh, I'm just happy to be here and uh, and work on work on the house and uh, furnish it and uh, and just um, it's uh, yeah it's it's an old one and then they renovated it in a way that it's just like the the way that they were doing it in the late '80s were let's just say they didn't know what they were doing at that time so we're just gonna try and 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 have more respect for these old stones and and undo the insults that were done to to this old house and uh make it something that is comfortable uh for for us people of the 21st centuries um but still uh, keep the 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 spirit of the the 1800s i love it yeah i'm a, i don't know if you know i'm a former real estate agent so there's a part of me that really oh, wow. kind of gets excited about about houses and um, especially yeah. old historic ones that are being renovated in like a cool way. And, and I'm just happy for you, man. I know that's a goal, um, to just have a place that you can call your own, you know, to have a quiet place yeah. in the countryside with a little bit of land. And that's the life that when we were talking a couple years ago that you, in, Oh, hold on. Are we there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I can hear you. Oh, it's switched. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Now it's switched back over. Okay. Uh, yeah, when we were talking, uh, I guess a, about a year ago or something, that was like a dream a goal that you had for yourself. So it's really neat to see that that's kind of come into fruition, and that's a fun project to uh, to work on to have to have a house that you can renovate and make it your own. Um, 
Have you ever heard of this show, uh, MTV Cribs? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, yeah. So now yeah. I want to. Now I'm having the idea that I want to do BOD Cribs. Uh, yeah. Next time, next time I want to come to your house. So it's it's renovated. I want to I want to interview you while we walk around. Maybe we go for a dip in your pool. We go ride around your neighborhood. Yeah. That would be a good episode. That's, yeah, that would be cool. That would be really cool. BOD Cribs with Sofian Sahili. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, it's a pretty cool house. I, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm genuinely, I'm excited. I would, I'd be very interested to see it and to, uh, and maybe even make this a reality. Um, my girlfriend and I are currently working on, uh, we want to do a bike tour in Europe and we want to do a pre- proper bike tour, like probably mostly paved, not big miles, focusing on, art, culture, food, scenery, that kind of stuff. Uh, I know you're a, a big bike tour. You do, you have done, and you go on a lot of tours. What is your favorite region of Europe to go and tour, if you had to pick one? Wow. Um, France is pretty cool. <laughs> Southern France? <Yeah. laughs> no, honestly, honestly, France is good. Um, south of Italy is good as well. South of Italy is really good. Yeah. Uh, some of the islands like Sardinia is, is pretty awesome too. Um, it's, it's like, I would say, yeah, South of Europe, especially, yeah. South of, South of France, South of Italy, Spain. These are, I would say if you're, if you're going to ride on road, what's great about, about France is like, there's such a network, uh, that you can always find, secondary roads that are super quiet um spain doesn't have the same kind of network but drivers are extremely respectful and uh and the south of italy especially if you go towards uh south of naples and going towards anything that is between naples and and, uh sicily is like so quiet basically the the um, the course of the two volcano sprint uh, that is pretty amazing. Like takes you through Calabria, and it's uh, uh, food is awesome, uh, and roads are extremely quiet. Some some picturesque villages, but yeah, I would say if you if you if you want the real stuff, uh, yeah, the thing about South of France is that you get you get the quiet roads, you get the great weather, and and, and the thing that we have here is just the villages are are some of the most beautiful that you will see in the world Mm. for sure. That's what I'm into. Yeah. So, uh, Natalie and I will plan our bike tour. And, uh, after we do our bike tour, um, I'll come and do a BOD cribs and check out your new crib and, uh, catch up with you. Maybe, maybe in your home turf this town time. Sure. Let's do it. You came to America. It's my turn to go to my turn to (laughs) go there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Right. Well, listen, man, I, I appreciate it. It's always an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, you said, I, I referenced it earlier, but you said on your social media posts that your caption was too long and Instagram cut you off. Is there anything that we didn't talk about today? Is there anything that you wanted to say to your followers that we hadn't touched on yet? Or, or did we hit all the bases? I'm, I am, I'm, I'm a chatty person when it comes to, to the, the subject of myself <laughs> and, <laughs> and bikes. Uh, so I could go on for probably another five hours, but it is 8.30 here and I haven't had dinner yet. And Fanny hasn't had dinner yet. And it's time to, it's time to go, man. It's time yeah. to go and have dinner and then uh, watch a movie. Uh, so I guess. That sounds perfect. That's it. Let's, that's a wrap, man. Let's wrap it up. We'll, we'll save it up for the next one. And and uh, like yeah, you said, sure. food is better when you're hungry. So it sounds like you're hungry. So this food will taste I a little am, bit better. I am, and, and I'm pretty sure that Fanny's even hungrier. And I don't, I don't want, yeah. So that's good. good. I, we need to, we need to go. It was, what? it was, uh, uh, as always, a uh, great, great pleasure to to chat with you, Patrick. Uh, always, always to 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 be on the show and uh, and have this conversation with you. Um, so here's to having uh, many more. Uh, yes, sir. And uh, hopefully, I'll see you. I'll see you in the in the in the summer, and I'll uh, and I'll uh, take you on a few rides around around home. I would love that. Thanks for sharing your Bye, time, man. and tell tell Fanny thanks for sharing you too. Y'all have a good night. Bye. See you. Bye. bye.
All right, everyone, thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. And again, a big shout out goes to Sofian for coming on today's episode. What a way to kick off the year. But wait, we're not done. Next week's episode is going to be with Angus Morton, who is the filmmaker behind the Divide film featuring Lachlan Morton as he took on the Tour Divide in 2023 as an ITT. Obviously, this was a documented event. And so that episode is going to come out next week, and I'm super excited for it. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please consider supporting the Bikes for Death podcast. Of course, you can always sign up to support us directly through Patreon at patreon.com forward slash bikes for death. You can also support us quite easily by using our affiliate links. They can be found at bikesfordeath.com. Underneath the stores tab, we have a list of affiliate links there. Every time you use one, Bikes or Death gets a little kickback. And many of our affiliate links include discounts for you, the listener. And don't forget to take advantage of the new Axle Pack from Old Man Mountain and be the first to get your hands on this new product. Visit oldmanmountain.com forward slash BOD. And don't forget to use the code mountains or death at checkout to receive 10% off. Thank you so much for being here. It's a blast. It is great to be back in a new year. I am so excited for 2024 and the things that are coming down the pipeline. So hold on to your bike seat. It's going to be a hell of a year until next week. You know what to do. Go ride your damn bike. It was the middle of the night. You grabbed your knife and you held it tight. The sounds of beasts kept you awake. The sounds they made kept you afraid. In the morning, you packed your bike. Memories forgotten from the previous night. You rode faster than ever before. Was it your imagination or merely folklore? Fear turned into strength as you pushed further. Every pedal stroke stronger and firmer. Your bike feels weightless. Your legs aren't tired. You think to yourself, just a few more miles. Bikes. Four.